You're listening to the OCD Stories podcast, hosted by me, Stuart Ralph. The OCD Stories is a podcast dedicated to raising awareness and understanding around obsessive compulsive symptoms. I do this through interviewing inspired therapists, psychologists, and people who have experienced OCD. Welcome to the OCD Stories. And welcome to episode 396. And on this one, I got on Dr. Jesse Spiegel and Dr. Sarah Hader. Jesse and Sarah are licensed clinical psychologists working with OCD. We discuss their therapy stories, why exposure and response prevention therapy doesn't work sometimes, including intensity, frequency and duration. We cover asking clients to tell on themselves, psychoeducation, checking for small compulsions that interrupt ERP, mental compulsions, how much homework is ideal, uncertainty, reassurance and much more. And thank you to NoCD for supporting the podcast. NoCD offers effective and convenient therapy available in the US and outside the US. To find out more about NoCD, their therapy plans, if they currently take your insurance, or to download their free app, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories, or the link will be in the episode description. Thank you to all of our patrons for supporting our work. To sign up to our Patreon and to check out the other benefits you'll receive as a patron, please see the link in the show notes. So thank you to Jesse and Sarah for their time. I deeply appreciate it. And of course, thank you to you guys as always for listening. It means a lot. And without further ado, here's Jesse and Sarah. Welcome to the show, Jesse and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's good to have you on. And, and as you know, before we jump into it, I'd love to hear both your kind of therapy journeys, what got you into being therapists and in particular working with OCD? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm happy to jump in first. Uh, Jesse and I both went to Widener University in Philadelphia to get our PsyD degree. And that's a primarily um, sort of psychoanalytic, psychodynamic based mm-hmm. doctoral program. Um, so during my internship there, I worked in community mental health, loved that, moved to Los Angeles, um, and all of my mentors in Philadelphia, where the program was based, advised that I take on a specialty for my postdoc, um, which happened to be pediatric OCD with Jenny Yip at Renewed Freedom Center. And um, unlike the work I had been doing, which there's absolutely a place, I think, for object Mm. relations and psychodynamic therapy, just not with OCD. Mm. Um, So uh, the patients got better and really quickly. So, um, So I was hooked and I sort of shudder to think, I was thinking of this this morning, actually, Um, But I think of it a lot. I have one patient at my internship when I was in Philadelphia who so clearly has OCD. Um, Mm. When I worked with her, and this was, I don't know, 15 plus years ago, she had been at the clinic 10 years already, had never received an OCD diagnosis, including when I worked with her. I had, she had a diagnosis of 14 different phobias. Wow. Um, and panic disorder, and nobody could make sense of it because the phobias would switch out. <laughs> and it, ju- I mean, it's just sort of heartbreaking when you think mm. that, that this is someone who's trying their best and and seeking therapy and um, isn't even getting a proper diagnosis, much less treatment. Um, so, so then it became my mission, I think, to really just try and deliver the best treatment possible. Um, and train others to the extent that I can. Yeah, well, it, ha- it happens a lot, doesn't it? Unfortunately, I know, <laughs> but yeah. it happened for me. You know that I was one of the people in that boat, and it just it doesn't feel good. But you live and no, learn. Of course not. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, and I would point out, Sarah had graduated her five year program about a few years, I think, before I even started it. Yes. Um, and um, I was in the last year of our program and uh my supervisor had i kind of was telling her about some of my interests and she mentioned to me that um there was this big conference that was going to be in philadelphia it was the anxiety depression association of america's conference and there was a former graduate who was going to be there and i should meet her and she was in los angeles and so i met sarah and we 
established a connection. But meanwhile, I then moved to New York for my postdoc, my fellowship, although Sarah and I maintained a relationship. And um, at the time uh, of my life, I had finished the fellowship and I, there was an opportunity to come to California for a brief position. Um, and I decided, OK, I'm going to do this. Take a risk. Why not? Um, and uh I still had maintained relationship with Sarah and I was telling her about my interests and how I was looking to really kind of own in on my CBT skills some more and more behavioral work and that I wanted to treat anxiety disorders. And Sarah told me that, um, would I have any interest in OCD and treating OCD? And I really, I didn't really have a sense one way or the other. And I, I said, I was like, I, I'm not really sure. Honestly, I don't have a ton of experience with, with treating OCD clients and with the ERP. And she said, you know, if you can learn to treat OCD, it'll be very helpful in treating anxiety disorders. Hmm. And so anyway, um, I actually ended up working with Sarah in Sarah's new practice, and I was very fortunate to receive training from her, and she was very, 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 very foundational for me, uh, and uh, I found myself really just hooked in uh, with the population, with the clients, um, whether it was working with kids or adults, and just really being able to see some some very brave people face their fears and really find see how effective the treatment could be when implemented in a really really positive way and flexible way nice nice and thank you for intertwining your stories there um so t- today we're going to talk about troubleshooting erp when it's not working um now obviously it's sold all the time as the gold standard and it's very effective as we all know um but some people, I guess that that phrasing gold standard, in my opinion, could be quite problematic for people, especially if they're struggling with it or it's not working for them or, or whatever it is. Um, so I guess maybe this episode hopefully can help give those people some hope and understanding of ways of improving it and, and things to, to, to watch out for. So um i guess a big open question initially is like why does erp not work sometimes i would say i mean uh, there could be any number of reasons why erp doesn't work and somebody may not be the best candidate for erp or they may need erp in conjunction with another treatment. Um, Jesse and I have had a a lot of discussions about this over the past couple of years. Um, And we've done a lot of training therapists on this topic of before we say that ERP is not working, let's make sure that that we've got the nuts and bolts right. Um, And that within the treatment protocol, there aren't things that even excellent therapists um, might, they might be missing um, within their treatment. Um, And we were excited to talk with you so that we can reach an audience of people who have OCD um, rather than people who treat OCD so that people who have OCD can become more aware of um, what to look for in therapy Um, and what nuances um, within exposure response prevention protocols, you know, may or may not be targeted in their own therapy sessions. Um, So that's sort of our premise is let's really understand um, what, not only what exposure response prevention is, but what are these components in terms of intensity, frequency, duration, that even the most skilled therapists, including ourselves, um, sometimes miss. Um, And let's go back and target those before we move on to a different type of treatment, um, which may or may not be necessary. Yeah, and I I would add, um, I I would add is, you know, education is always a very key component. Um, I mean, th- there's always a lot of statistics coming out that are showing the length of time before someone 
really gets effective treatment and that they go many years, whether it's because they themselves don't seek treatment or they get the wrong type of treatment. So obviously I'd say education is always going to be a very, a very key component for someone to have an understanding of what's what's what their issues are and what may be maintaining their difficulties. I would also like to add is that each person is unique. And one particular challenge is having a cookbook, uh, kind of a, a specific manual that works for all, really works for none, is what I would say. And um, a big thing is really looking at the individual person. What are they doing? What are they doing that is observable, that we can see? What are things that they're doing in their head to get rid of whatever the obsession is, the distress and because that actually may be a lot more nuanced and that a lot of clinicians are missing. And, you know, I'd say the person, the sufferer, they may have a sense that they're doing it, but not to, uh, to not to quite such a T of, oh, I'm doing these th- things in my head to answer a question uh, of about a certain distress and so forth. And having that nuance can be very helpful of, oh, this is what's maintaining the difficulties. And then this is also what will provide the roadmap for me to get better. I'll often ask um, my OCD patients to tell on themselves um, because most of the people, even kids who are initially um, brought to treatment by their parents, um, once they have that education and um uh, there's a level of excitement, even if there's trepidation to get better. And as therapists, we can inadvertently uh, be giving reassurances all the time and not know it. Um, so I've made it a standard in treatment to, to ask, um, is there anything I'm doing <laughs> where I, where you or anything you're asking um, that's actually, you know, feeding into a compulsion? at least 50% of the time, somebody will say yes, <laughs> you know, right there in the session. I mean, it's wild, actually, um, as therapists, uh, that, and I'm just building off your point, Jesse, that um, there are these um, thought or mental compulsions or, um, or, or tricky ways. Oh, I, I'm just trying to think this I actually heard at um, an IOCDS IOCDF convention, somebody had BDD and they would get their hair cut um, and walk into their therapist's office. And and the therapist didn't know that part of the BDD was around um, hair. And so um, they would walk into the therapist's office and say, oh, I'm sorry, I was late. I was just getting my hair cut. It ran over. And then the therapist would say, that's okay. It looks nice. <laughs> and so they, the um, the person finally confessed, no, that was a compulsion. <laughs> I needed you to tell me that my hair looked nice before I told you that I had BDD around hair. And I, and I knew all the rest I would hear from you was that it didn't look nice. Um, and so I needed to know, I needed to have that as a baseline before I could trust you enough to tell you about the hair BDD. So there's moments like that um, that we just want to keep checking in about uh, so that we're not inadvertently part of the OCD. If you're working with kids um, or or if your patients have partners or family members, um, you want to make sure they're checking in too. Um, something Jesse and I talked about with duration is this, this idea that um, someone who does an exposure in session with their therapist may still be feeling uncomfortable when they leave the session. And we want to ensure that they know in advance to set aside time where they're not leaving the session and practicing avoidance um, by going on their phone um, or heading right into the next activity. Um, And it's also helpful if therapists set up the next session in the beginning of the session and then prep the person to say at the end, you may still be triggered. And even though we won't be actively engaged in the exposure together, you know, keep up with feeling that level of discomfort um, for as long as you can. And therefore, as therapists, we like to wrap it up 
with a bow, I think, at the end of the session and make sure the person is feeling nice before we send them on their way. And I think it's important when we consider this duration component that that may not be appropriate um, with exposure response prevention when you're doing an in-session exposure, that I think it's helpful to prep the person in advance and say, um, as we wrap up, plan to be in a place where you're going to continue feeling uncomfortable um, and I don't want to wind up feeding into an avoidance compulsion. So um, this might not be wrapped up nicely at the end of end of our hour together. Uh, so Sarah, so early on in the session, session, do you check in and and let them know that this may not get neatly wrapped up? You may be leaving today with these feelings and thoughts. Absolutely. And to Jesse's point, I think that's part of the psychoeducation before somebody starts, I mean, um, really in an initial consultation, mm. even is to know what to expect. Um, the treatment is difficult. And I think um, it becomes less difficult, um, especially for well, for any of us and for people with OCD, um, where uncertainty is in and of itself its own trigger. So I think it becomes less difficult um, if there's knowledge of what this could look like. And it could look like, I'll say, set aside 90 minutes for this, for when we first begin um, exposures. It's a time commitment as much as anything else. Um, especially when you're working with well, people in general. I work with a pediatric population. And so um, parents who have to set aside not only the commute to and from the session, they have to set aside an additional 90 minutes. We want them to know that in advance um, and know not to make demands of their children beyond um, ensuring that the exposure protocol is sort of sees its course. I'll, I'll add, because um, I see with the sessions, I always want to make sure we're practicing exposures in session. Um, I think this is a, a nuance uh, that really whoever you're working with needs to provide this opportunity because it's essentially, you know, if you had a personal trainer and they go over a whole schedule with you and then they tell you, OK, now you're going to do the workout on your own. You actually have to practice this in the session. Um, but one of the things that I will do, so if we we're, when we're having a session is, um, you know, I'll give an example, um, a young adult client of mine, we were doing uh, exposures with uh, related to harm obsessions, and they were holding a knife. And while they were holding their knife, it seemed like their distress was going down. And so I checked in with them. I was like, is there anything, anything that you're doing to make this a little easier for yourself? And they're like, no, not really. I'm like, are you sure? I just want to check in. Is there anything of how you're looking at the knife? They're like, well, I'm actually trying to look at the reflection and actually just see myself. And the thing of what they were trying to basically communicate is they were not trying to really take on the intensity piece and the kind of what they were what was bringing in them in, which is what if I were to do something that could harm myself. And so then it was about refocusing. Okay, let's actually focus in on the sharp part, maybe in scary thoughts at the same time. And so I'd say likewise, the same thing is there's always needs to be this check in what are you doing anything in your head is, is there if there's nothing I can see, is there anything going on in your head that maybe you're trying to answer the question or, or, or trying to make this a little bit lighter for yourself? Well, I'm telling myself that, you know, in another 10 minutes, I know the time's up. And I know you have someone who you have to see right after me. I, you know, then I may make a joke. Well, actually, I, I told them uh, I'm going to cancel the appointments for today. So you're actually the only person I'm seeing. <laughs> so I'll try to make a little bit of a lighthearted comment. Although at the same time, I want them to be really fully aware. Is there anything that they're doing, any type of escape, any type of way, whether it's a white knuckling approach, trying to get around it? And we really want them to sit with the discomfort. Now, obviously, you don't want it to be so, so overwhelming that they're going to jump away from it. But it's just the point of this work is I want to bring on discomfort, even if it's really hard, 
because the alternative from a long-term perspective is not wanted and it's not going to allow me to have the life that I want to live. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, yeah, it brings to mind a, a, a client, a former client of mine where, um, around contamination and, and when I was introducing ERP to them and they'd be like, yeah, but I've been exposing myself for years, you know, touching everything that's contaminated and trying to live my life anyway. And it's not worked. And I'm like, yeah, but you've also been doing compulsions the entire time. So that's why, that's why it's not working. Um, and I, it's a more extreme version of what you're saying, but yeah, you, when you're then doing ERP, you're looking out for those micro compulsions they're doing, be it in their head, physical, uh, that's, that's interrupting the potential success of the exposure. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I would I would actually say it's interesting is um, a lot of clinicians will just start off and they'll make a hierarchy and they'll they'll kind of just jump into that and that really you have to spend time on what is going on right now. Mm-hmm. I actually think if you really identify the compulsions uh, and, and you know what is observable, everything that they're trying to do to answer the question again, you know, basically eliminate their 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 said fear. Um, whether it's in their head or observable or whether it's um, some type of friend or family member, that actually creates basically in of itself what needs to be done from an exposure standpoint. Uh, the, the, the creating its own, it, it creating a separate hierarchy is, is kind of becomes a bit unnecessary. Um, so that response prevention piece is just so, so vital. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Sarah, I think you were going to say something a second ago. Oh, uh, just an add on. I mean, I think I think we all have plenty of examples. I'm working with a family right now um, that are just um, I've known them for a while. The older sister had OCD and then uh, it turns out the younger son does, too. And the family have worked so hard with the sister. Um, And so the parents on their own, um, we're working with this younger brother to overcome the OCD and, and it wasn't working. And I think it was this piece where, for instance, uh, um, he couldn't stand seeing spit. So, um, uh, the dad would sort of wrangle him. He's eight now. So the dad would sort of wrangle him and they would, um, every time this boy had to brush his teeth, the dad would brush his teeth too. And then, spit into the sink and they'd say we've been doing this for months and it's not even a little bit better and it 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 was uh i checked in with the boy and it was this white knuckling experience where he said like well i just i know i'm gonna have to do it so i've gotten to a place where i'll just like sort of willingly head into the bathroom watch my dad brush his teeth but the whole time i'm singing a song in my head Mm -hmm. um and so the parents are seeing okay, toothbrushing is maybe a tiny little bit easier, but everything else is blown up. And it's because um, there was this built in, I would say, compulsion of avoidance. Hmm. Uh, And so that's what we want to, I think as clinicians, we do that a lot. Um, And parents um, or partners of loved ones with OCD, um, you know, we I think inadvertently feed into it a, a, a lot without with thinking that we're doing an exposure when we might really um, not be checking in with for this little boy. It was just too hard. You know, it wasn't a real, he was, he was never going to be able to attend to his dad spitting out toothpaste. Um, when the parents came up with that idea, they thought this is the simplest version of spit and the easiest version of spit we can come up with because um, it's built in day to day. Um, And for him, it was the absolute worst because he was so close to it. Um, So that's the other piece with intensity um, is we've got to check in and make sure that when we're looking at that hierarchy and when we're planning exposures, um, we're choosing exposures that will have the right intensity, um, that it's challenging without being overwhelming. A lot of times um, someone might go along with an exposure knowing or maybe not knowing 
um, that mentally they'll be engaged in a whole bunch of compulsions, even as physically and observably they are exposing themselves to the, the whatever is feared. And that's where um, I think it's so important for people who are receiving treatment to really have a very candid relationship with their therapist. Um, and and I think most OCD therapists would really value that as well, right? Um, just this idea of we want we want anyone to feel comfortable advocating for themselves and saying this is too hard for me. I'll often say, I, you, let me know if this is too hard, and you could give me, I could give you, you know, fifteen different versions of an exposure. And if you're telling me that they're all too hard, I'm going to trust you. It's my job to come up with something that's going to be manageable, Hmm. Um, you know, so that we're really hitting that sweet spot where the person is triggered um, without being so overwhelmed that, that their brain just shuts down. Um, And Jesse, I know you had talked about that too, within the context of personal training and just, um, you can't do it. You can't keep up with it. If somebody prescribes something that's too difficult, yeah. your muscles will give out. That's true. Yeah. You'll, you'll tear a tendon or, um, yeah. We just won't be able to lift the weight. Um, yeah. Okay. No, good, good points. Um, and yeah, and I think, you know, what, what you're saying there, Sarah, about intensity, I think it's important because, Obviously, we're talking about when ERP is not working, but there'll be a population of people listening to this who are afraid to even try ERP or start it um, because they're f- fearful maybe that the therapist will push them harder than they want to go or um, they won't be able to bear it or cope with it. Um, and now you're saying, yeah, the therapist shouldn't be. It's, it's the duties on the therapist to find, keep keep adjusting until they find an exposure at the intensity that the person is ready to take. Even if that seems incredibly small initially. Absolutely. I'll, I'll say you can even, I call them OCD rules. I call the uh, compulsions OCD rules. And I'll say we, you can keep the rule if we do it just a little bit differently. Hmm. You know, so, and, and that's very effective. I, I think, especially initially, um, as we're hoping that that person sort of builds in motivation um, and belief in themselves that they can handle hard things. Yeah, I, I was I watched um, a film. This is about a year or two years ago. It was based on a true story of this woman who was living a very sedentary and inactive life, and she was very frustrated and fed up with herself. And ultimately, she did want to run uh, and she wanted to run a marathon. The first thing she had to do was put on her sneakers. Mm -hmm. That was actually a big, big step. Then after that, it was literally just going around the block. And, And I think, you know, we need to take people for where they are. And again, it's not it's not just jumping straight, straight in the deep end. Um, so this is always something that should be led by the client, by the patient. It should not be led um, by the therapist. I, I, you know, I'd say one thing is I see the therapist is almost functioning in many ways as a coach in, in guiding you. Uh, however, you know, we've got to meet you where, where you're at. And so that doesn't mean if you have been engaging in significant avoidance and it's really, really overwhelming. Well, that if you have harm uh, obsessions, for instance, that your first exposure should be about um, picking up a knife and (laughs) putting it next to your throat. You would need to take some smaller steps first. Hmm. Yeah. Good, good points. Good points. Um, So we talked about intensity. We've talked, um obviously about mental compulsions frequency any anything else to say on that like how how often should we be doing it and homework and and all of this stuff I, I, from a from a frequency standpoint what can be problematic let's say if you're meeting with a therapist you're doing the exposure thank god 
I don't have to do it again. And I'm not going to see you for a week. Oh, and by the way, actually next week, I've got something that came up. So we're going to actually have to meet in two weeks. Oh, actually something else came up in two weeks. We're going to have to meet in three weeks. That can be when it's a little bit more problematic because if you're seeing that the approach is more of an avoidance approach. Now, I, I'm not trying to entail that, you know, doing some of these things that are difficult, whether they're fears related to contamination, sexual obsessions, whatever they are, that they're supposed to be enjoyed and that they're the most exciting thing you're looking for. Although this is just viewing this as a process, again, is how is this getting in the way of what you're what you want and what from your life? You know, so from like a practical standpoint, um, uh, you know, I would say it, it, this is it really can depend. I mean, I think at a minimum, uh, you know, someone really needs to be practicing at least, you know, three set times a week. I still would say three, like three set days per week. I would still really say, though, is it the, the idea of bringing on discomfort needs to be just part of their daily experience. Now, if we're talking earlier on when someone is just starting exposure-based work, um, you know, needs to have, again, many days. I think sometimes for me, uh, I will usually tell someone that they can have, you know, one day where they don't have to do exposure work. And I don't know if that's maybe because I'm Jewish and I, you know, I, you know, the Shabbat and, I, you know, they need a day of rest. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that, you know, being a little lighthearted here. Um, but really that this is just, this is like part of a lifestyle and something that you're going to do. And again, the intensity piece of where you're going to do these very like specific exposures, this is not going to necessarily be something that you're going to have to do constantly for eternity. Now, it may be as far as you have bringing on discomfort as part of, you know, part of your regular life. So if you had contamination obsessions, you know, perhaps it's that if you dropped a, a piece of pretzel, and this is I'm talking when someone's much later on in their treatment, piece of pretzel on the ground, well, you just pick it up and eat. And that is actually just part of your daily living that you've incorporated versus a set time. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so that's a kind of from like a frequency earlier on, you know, that it is several days per week. And it's not just really, it's very important. That's just not only in the, the office with the therapist. Hmm. I think it's um, a use it or lose it sort of this is a um, it, it is it's a lifestyle switch. <clears throat> I know that Reed Wilson suggests having a ticker, which have, now these are much more popular post COVID <laughs> because every other establishment had to have a ticker to say how many people could come inside. Um, so uh, one of one of those sort of things, and they have apps for it now as well, where every single time you um, purposefully allow yourself to entertain uncertainty or to tolerate discomfort, um, you give yourself a click, a point, um, which is great feedback also uh, for people to see that actually, in many ways, they're able to pull in OCD <laughs> exposure is more or less, but it, it's not quite an exposure, but OCD, um, what would we call it? You know, you're, they're, they're, they're overcoming OCD in day-to-day -day experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and then during the course of therapy, I think that's where it is really important to set aside um, a chunk of time. I tell families to set aside a chunk of time for five days a week and, and hopefully that happens. And if not, um, then there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Uh, the proof is in the pudding though. I mean, it's like anything else. If you keep up with the exposures, then when I see you next week, uh, that there will be improvement in that area. Um, and part of this podcast and this discussion is, well, what if there's not? And so that's where I'll tell families too. It's, it is important um, to keep up with the assignments and then to make sure that we're meeting. Um, and again, it's my responsibility. If you're coming in a week later and you've done these exposures and things aren't, there isn't any improvement. Um, now I've got to go into the nuts and bolts and figure out um, what's wrong. You know what's happening here because I work with the pediatric population. A lot of times, it'll be the parents. I'm sort of 
I'll say kind of wrangling the kids into exposures and the parents are exhausted. The kids are angry. They've all done the exposures. There is no improvement. And I think it can go back to maybe the intensity piece, maybe the white knuckling piece where um, everyone's doing on the surface or on paper what they're supposed to. Um, uh, but then we need to circle back and figure out what's a more appropriate exposure that's more while still being difficult, more manageable um, for the kid and the family where this child can feel really, and, and adult, it applies to adults as well, but where you can feel really proud of what you've done um, rather than simply like I'm checking off a box. And I think with that level of pride, it becomes more manageable to sort of build in on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, in an initial consultation, I'll try to figure out what what activities the person likes, you know, just to get to know them a bit. But typically, if somebody has learned a second language or if they were ever involved in any sports um, or um, a musical instrument or whatever it might be, uh, you have to practice in order to become fluent, so to speak, in that area. So if somebody shows up for piano once a week, um, you, they will, over the course of time, learn, um, even if they never practice outside of that piano lesson. However, they'll never become fluent, and it will be hard for them to pick up um, new pieces of music and teach themselves how to play. And that's our goal as OCD therapists, is we want you in treatment for a short period of time um, until you know how to manage OCD on your own. You know, it's not until OCD is gone. That's just a, that's, that's just not, um, that's not a goal because it's not realistic. It's how do you, how do you live with OCD where you're not bothered by it and you feel confident um, that, that as you sense it sort of surging in your life, you can manage it. So that's what we're hoping to build in, I think, is this idea of how much time to set aside. It's sort of like, in my mind, well, how much time do you need to make this part of your lifestyle? I guess it'd be the same. Yeah, the same. if you're learning a, a foreign language, initially it might be, okay, how much time do I need to set aside to really practice, practice, practice? And then it becomes, um, how do I keep this as part of my lifestyle so that I don't lose it? Yeah, really, really good point. Um, okay, so what, what else are we missing, do you think, that, that you might be looking out for when someone comes back and they go, it's not working, like it's just not working for me? What other things are you looking out for? Um, well, the, I mean, any of number of things. Uh, differ, differential diagnosis, you know, and are there other diagnoses present? Um, the neurodiverse population of mm. exposures look different. Um, learning differences. Uh, do, do we need this person to be doing um, rather than sort of verbal exposures? Do we need them to do social stories or be looking at uh, looking at things rather than talking about things? Um, medication, you know, we want to consider um, are are these the right medications? I I can't tell you how how many people. Um, and at my treatment center, um, a therapist, I mean, this has happened to me even where I'll have to check in with patients that I think I know really well. And it turns out that they've smoked marijuana before the session or taken a Xanax right before walking into a therapy session. Um, so it's really just a lot of education about. And the idea is I did this so that I can be present to do the exposure. These aren't people that are trying to get get out of the exposure experience mm. um, and simply show up and not, and not, uh, you know, not really be there. Um, it's people that are saying I'm actually that elevated that I want to come down to a level where I can tolerate the exposure. And again, I think that goes back to intensity. Um, mm. I'm, I'm saying like people I would never guess and then I'll check in with them and it and it turns out that there's some sort of version of that of um, prepping for the exposure that actually uh, it would be better if we started with a less intense exposure 
rather than having them um, take a Xanax so that they can manage a higher exposure and hopefully move. The, the idea for them is they want to move through treatment as quickly as possible. So let me jump into the hard ones. Um, they're not, I don't know that it's, uh, it's as effective. I mean, there's, there's a lot though of these like sort of outside influences, uh, family dynamics, family systems, huge, um, we'll pull in spouses, we'll pull in partners, um, parents all the time, um, to really provide education to them as well. If the patient feels that they haven't been able to advocate for themselves and the, the um, the family is maybe with the best of intentions, enabling, um, you know, or accommodating the uh, the OCD. What would you say, Jesse? Any of those that you want to sort of dive into? Yeah, I, and I think we could. I think each of them could lend to it's a whole another topic. And I, I think Sarah, you did a really good point in kind of talking about various complications. Um, that may come up that really are very, very valid, um, each in their own way. And again, whether, you know, OCD is not the primary thing going on, or if there's something else. Um, you know, another big piece that I would really bring up that may get generally gets mentioned um, is the concept of uncertainty. And um, treatment with OCD involves this embracing of uncertainty we're not here to answer you know yes or no to even your biggest fear of like you know what if i'm a pedophile well that's not that's not you know the the goal of treatment is not to have a definitive answer even to things that are you know scary harm obsessions you know what if i get sick and so forth it's again though embracing that uncertainty um so i mean I, you know uh I, you know I think often when I see with, you know, exposure work or if even people who are have seen other OCD therapists who are strong clinicians, when really checking in with um, with the client, the patient, as far as, you know, their work, well, what would, you know, I would ask, what would you do if, you know, these fears are you okay? Let's say if the idea of these, these fears come true, um, like that, you know, your mom who you really love so much, something did happen. Uh, and it was because something you did. Oh my God. But I mean, I don't really want that to actually happen. Hmm. Well, you know, I don't know if they've really embraced the concept of uncertainty completely. Now, obviously we're not wishing for these terrible things to happen. And um, that that really is not the goal, but it's more of like, you know, there's always the possibility of some of these things that they could happen. And even if they were to, well, how would you respond to it? And the idea that even if that happened, I can handle it. So I'd say, you know, some of these thoughts and feelings, our, our goal is to not rid them. Um, we're not trying to, you know, say, you know, you know, ideally OCD has less of an impact, but it's the idea of even if you have these thoughts, even if you have these feelings, you can handle them. Now I'd say conversely, likewise, usually when that happens, um, OCD is really less, a lot, lot less prevalent. But to me, that is such a big case uh, that you need to see in, in treatment is that you embrace uncertainty. I think that the challenge, which makes a ton of sense is for someone who's suffering from OCD, it is plaguing, it's exhausting, it's attacking your worst fears. So inviting uncertainty is not an easy concept. So I'm aware it's a, it's a big ask and it, it's a gradual process. It's not something that, you know, in those first few sessions, you can explain this whole thing and from a psychoeducation, how important it is and embracing uncertainty that they're, you know, totally hooked in on and get it right away. There, ha there are some cases where that happens, but it, it doesn't necessarily, although this, it's just such a big foundational piece for, um, for really anyone to have really sustained improvement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I mean, that's it. That's what, you know, it's the, the goal here um, of treatment, I think, is always for the person who is seeking treatment to leave knowing that they can handle anything. Um, so that way, whatever life 
throws at them or OCD throws at them, um, they they know that they'll be able to handle it. So, um, and that goes, I think it speaks to that point of uncertainty. I Another piece of this, I think, is um, teaching, uh, well, or for anyone who is listening, sort of um, encouraging people with OCD to really advocate for themselves when they're in therapy um, with their therapist, uh, because a, a lot of times, again, Jesse was saying, even really reputable, skilled OCD clinicians, even myself, um, we we are inadvertently sort of feeding into the OCD. Um, and then we'll talk about teachers, professors, bosses, non-OCD therapists, um, the referring therapist. I'm always doing a consultation with them when I refer the person back to say, um, it, you know, this is, this is what um, a response needs to look look like when somebody is asking, when somebody's OCD is asking you the question, right? Rather than um, this, and this is how you'll know if it's OCD uh, versus an honest question. And I like to say, we can always give an assurance when it turns into reassurance, you know, that's when Hmm. um, we want to be more aware of how we're responding. Um, So I think part of this also is teaching people to, to advocate for themselves um, with others in their life. Um, yeah. Are there any branches of that Stuart where it might be worthwhile to dig deeper? Yeah. Uh, all that was really good. Um, well, I like what you said then about assurance kind of versus reassurance. Um, and I wonder if maybe you could just expand on that for anyone that's not familiar with the difference between the two, because sometimes mm-hmm. we can think, you know, zero reassurance, but the first time is, is surely okay, right? Because that could generally be information. Um, mm-hmm. So just, yeah, anything you want to say say on that? Um, well, I think uh, as a rule of thumb, I'll say if this is, if it's a, if it's a new question um, or if it seems sincere, answer it you know, uh, to a a teacher or a coach or a parent um, or a partner. Um, And really, I think it's about open communication then with the person who has OCD um, to trust that uh, they know whether this is coming from a place of OCD um, or if it's just general um, confusion around a concept. Um, And the best I can say is it just starts to feel different. This is where, uh, you know, you'll talk to teachers and they'll say, you know, I have kids that that don't understand the concept. And in fact, I think this child does not understand the concept. The way in which they're asking questions just doesn't feel right, you know, um, or this will be where somebody might, um, they'll find it's a different question each time and it's asking the same thing. Um, So they might not be using the exact same wording. So this is when it starts to turn into reassurance. Um, Hmm. And we, we don't want to build shame around any OCD compulsions. And so uh, the idea is, okay, let's answer the question and then let's check in. If it seems like I've already answered this, um, is there something I'm saying that's confusing or is this OCD coming out, you know, um, and to trust that the the person can be honest with that response. Um, and sometimes I'll say we can, we can keep, can keep the reassurance compulsion, just do it a little differently. Um, and sometimes that's enough. So I'll say to parents like, okay, if your kid is saying it's not OCD and you're saying it is give them the answer, however, write it instead of, um, using words or say like, okay, I've already answered that a few times. I've got some other stuff I need to do. I'm going to come back to you in 10 minutes and check in and see if you still need me to to give you an answer to that question. So that there's ways around it where you're still um, building in some tolerance for the discomfort of not knowing um, while answering the question. Um, that makes sense. I, I can I can add to yeah. that, um, you know, wh- one thing that I was 
thinking about um, it, it, there is, uh, you know, there's a lot of distinguishing between information gathering and reassurance, uh, reassurance seeking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, the IOCDF came out with some information during the pandemic about this, a very good worksheet, um, just distinguishing it. Uh, but what I would say is everyone, whether they're a kid or an adult, sometimes it can actually take, you have to actually ask a few questions to understand it. So I think it, it's a, it's poorly representative. Someone needs just one explanation and then they should fully understand everything. And sometimes some people may ask a few follow-up questions because they don't really get anything. Uh, they don't really understand everything fully, especially if someone has like a learning disability. Um, so what I would say is, uh, going back to this is looking at what is the primary function of why someone uh, is asking the question that they are. So if it's, I don't really fully understand it. Well, yes, it should be described in another way. And I'd say Sarah did a great job, maybe as far as writing it, giving it a, a, a different modality too. Uh, if um, for providing the information, if it's, um, I'm feeling really anxious and overwhelmed, well, then that actually may be a case of where OCD is popping its head. Now, I'm also aware it could be a nuance where it could be, I'm anxious, and I don't fully understand. Uh, and in which case, you know, it's about taking it for the person's word. And if, you know, maybe having um, a more nuanced understanding and, and providing an explanation another way could be helpful, then I, I don't see any problem in providing more information there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you both. That, that clarifies it a lot more. Hopefully gives people some ideas. Um, so we're near the end of our time. So I wanted to ask you, is there anything else you guys want to say on this topic that might be helpful? I, one thing that I really would like to add, uh, is, OCD is, uh, it can be very overwhelming. I know we've talked about exposures and then they can feel very intimidating. And I think when you're stuck in a huge, huge storm, a tor it feels like an actual tornado, everything becomes blurred and suddenly you really lose your sense of reality and who you are as a person versus seeing OCD as a piece of your pie, not the entire pie. And so what I would say is, um, you know, something, you know, Sarah and me both talk about is you have many things that you do so, so well, whether you're, you know, a good partner, um, you know, a good son, a good daughter, you know, you have a lot of good friends, other things that you've really excelled at. And I would say, it's very important that this actually gets highlighted to ways that you've succeeded in spite of challenges, things that you've done very well, because you have these same skills, these same attributes that you have can be applied to this work and can be applied to the embracing uncertainty and facing discomfort. So it's, I'd say, really recognizing other ways that you've succeeded because that same logic can be applied to this work as well. Yeah, good point. Sarah, anything to, uh, to add? I mean, sure, a whole lot, <laughs> but for the sake of, uh, of of wrapping up, I think um, we've covered a lot of the nuts and bolts and the basics and um, really going back to frequency, intensity, duration, and looking in to figure out um, where we might need to make subtle shifts within that um, and and then if the exposures are still not providing um, a level of improvement that would be expected, then I think it's time to consider um, if the person is not already on medication, medication. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, hormones play a huge role in OCD. Um, I just worked with somebody that, well, this has happened twice in the past year. Um, they began hormones for menopause and their OCD symptoms significantly subsided. Um, we know that OCD manifests a lot of times around puberty. Um, and now um, there's a lot of information around postpartum OCD. So, you know, that we want to consider 
Um, oh, asking uh, teens if they are on birth control, that can have a, a, um, a big impact. So just looking holistically uh, yeah. also at the at the presentation and the person can stay on birth control. I've, I've just had teens change their birth control. So, you know, just to kind of uh, looking at the big picture, once we're sure that exposure response prevention is being effectively, um, I guess, effectively practiced. And then Jesse and I have both alluded to this, but I think it is imperative that OCD is is done in, I mean, exposures are done in session. Um, I, I just, I think that is essential. And I think whoever is doing the exposures needs to feel really confident in, um, in their ability to lead the session and to have partners or parents potentially sit in so that the partners and parents can lead at home um, so that the person continues to stay motivated, you know, and and, um, present during the exposures when they're doing them on their own. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really good points. And um, I am trying to cover... um, especially around menopause, do an episode on that and uh, HRT. I just need the right medical professional to to cover it that gets OCD and hormones, you know, um, yeah. in a deep way. I have so, one for you, so I'll, I'll, I'll oh, look let, back. Let me know. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Thank yeah. you. Um, so last, last question then from me is um, you both have a billboard. What do you want written on that billboard? Okay. I was going to say, Jesse, you go first, <laughs> just to put you in the hot seat. <laughs> put us on the spot. <laughs> I thought of one. I think it could say, I think you can handle it. Hmm. Nice. That's, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with that. You can handle it. Well, I would say um, you've got this believe in yourself, um, you know, again even if it's difficult you've got this believe in yourself yeah nice i like that i like, What's that. I like them both Stuart? what what was that what is your billboard my billboard um <laughs> what would i have probably just it gets better mm. yeah it's the message of of hope. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. Well, look, guys, thank you so much for for coming on the show and and sharing your expertise. I I appreciate it. Um, and links to all your stuff in the show notes if anyone wants to check it out. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast, and thank you to our patrons who helped make this episode possible. And if you would like to find out more about Patreon and the rewards and benefits then there will be a link in the episode description. If you enjoy the OCD Stories podcast and would like to support us with a one-time tip slash donation, please go to theocdstories.com forward slash support. All tips, no matter how large or small, are greatly appreciated. Please subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to the podcast. And thank you to NoCD for supporting our work. If you want to find out more about NoCD, head to go.treatmyocd.com forward slash the OCD stories or click the link in the episode description. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. And until we speak, take care.